for joining us today at thelandjournal.next. Uh, we're here at the Land Conference, the 2019 Lay of the Land Conference. And we are here with Casey Conway, who is the Chief Economist of the CCIM Institute. He is also an economist at Alabama University, or University of Alabama, <laughs> said that backwards. And so he just spoke to our group today, and we just wanted to come in and, and have a little conversation and share some of the things that were kind of highlights and the most important to Florida landowners. Um, so, Casey, thanks for joining us today. You bet. Appreciate you being here. Um, first of all, will you tell us a little bit about your favorite economist? <laughs> <laughs> so my, my favorite economist is Yogi Berra. <laughs> so Yogi Berra had a, had a phrase or a, you know, a, a statement that seems to capture everything that will ever happen. So the two I highlighted were um, that the future ain't what it used to be, and it's like deja vu all over again. So, you know, go check Yogi Bear out. He'll, he'll guide you through the, uh, through the economics. <laughs> yeah, we had a fun time today. It was a really entertaining uh, speech that you gave. And uh, we'll have some resources from your speech and some slides and some papers that you have um, available on our website as well. So I encourage people to, to check that out. Um, you talked a little bit about the Tax Act and recovery in Florida over the last decade or so. Can you kind of give an overall picture of how you see things going in Florida? Sure, so Florida, I, I highlighted in a, in a map, you know, the, uh, the different states and the growth, and in particular in the South. So if you went back a year ago, the different Southern states were growing at about one and a half to two and a half percent GDP, mm -hmm. and they're now growing more than double that. In fact, Florida is over four and a half percent GDP. And so when you look at really what stimulated that, the Tax Act had a, had a big impact. Uh, one mm -hmm. part was on the export side of it. So. What's going on with the tariffs right now could, could change that in six months from now. But um, I think the other thing I wanted to emphasize was that Florida's economy is much more diverse than what it was, say, 10 years ago. The housing piece was driving way too much of the mm -hmm. Florida economy. Housing and tourism were big pieces of it. Today, you look at it much more, much more diverse. It's logistics, it's transportation, it's manufacturing. Uh, it really is across the board, simulation engineering, uh, you know, tapping into everything that NASA gave us and yeah. the theme parks and whatnot. So it's a much more diverse economy that I think can withstand a lot more bumps in the road. Yeah. You also had a lot to say about Lakeland and Winter Haven. So our office, our home office is in Lakeland, um, and a lot of our guests today are actually kind of from that area in Polk County. Um, talk a little bit about Nucor and what was going on there with steel and what you see that doing for that area. Yeah, so Lakeland is an important part and the whole Central Florida Winter Haven area is an important part of the really what's what's going on in Florida. I describe it as it's the inland empire of California. It's where all of the, you know, the the collection of the goods and materials and commodities occur and uh, and get redistributed to. So um, Nucor, if people, a little trivia question I like to do is where in the United States is the most amount of steel production going on? And it's, it's in Lakeland, Winter Haven, Central Florida with the new modern Nucor plant, all of the steel rebar that we use in construction, mm -hmm. uh, the big steel I-beams that we use for all these new modern warehouses and, and buildings that we're making are all made there. So that shocks people. They think, you know, it's somewhere up in the Midwest or the Great Lakes and yeah. it's high tech and it's here. So it's a big story. Wow. Um, I have some notes because I'm not an <laughs> economist, so I had to listen very carefully to your speech. Um, you talked a little bit about also uh, a lot of our clients are, you know, they have uh, land that they may be converting to development land, and so they're very interested in residential development and trends and, and what that does to their land values. You talked about construction and building costs and how that affects land values. Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. So the you know, in the, in the past, where we are in the, in the cycle, we would normally begin to see the cities growing out again and chewing up, you know, agricultural and, and suburban lands, and we're not seeing that as much this time around. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is the millennial generation is becoming more urban in their orientation than suburban. They don't want to know what a commute is. They don't want to own a car. They don't want to, they don't, will not need a two-car garage. <laughs> They're going to Uber everything. Um, and so the impact of that means, one, the demand is different. It's going to be more urban. We adaptively reuse old closed buildings, retail, whatever. Mm -hmm. The other piece of it is that the construction costs, because land is the last piece that get, gets compensated for mm -hmm. in the equation, the old land residual analysis. So if costs are rising and whatnot, there's a pressure upstream 
to capture more of those dollars, investment dollars, and, and leave less residual to the land. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing construction costs double digit numbers right now. Mm -hmm. And a big part of that is the, is the hurricanes. So the hur hurricane rebuilding, it's, you know, we've never had a two, three, five year period where we had five category three or four storms hit the United States and all in big population areas. So um, you guys had Southwest Florida, Houston, we've had all of the mid-Atlantic. Um, so, you know, if we have another one or two, uh, but all the contractors, all the labor, all the materials, and people forget the gift that Katrina gave us uh, mm -hmm. because of this impact was toxic sheetrock. So let's hope we don't go, go back there, but yeah. huge pressures being put on construction materials. We're seeing about over 10% a year right now. So uh, that's really gonna impact what someone could pay for the land at the, at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So that's something important for, and what would probably be something in a year from now that, I mean, would that, change over how long would that pressure last do you think so after Katrina it was a two to three year impact mm -hmm. and so that was just one storm and so now we've got five of them that we're rebuilding from and then you know we don't know what happens in the next one two three years with yeah. storms as well so well, this is be a, another one yeah I have a feeling that there'll be another one so uh, this is at least a multi-year uh, issue two mm -hmm. three years um, that we have to work our way through okay. are there any positives about residential development right now with our uh, you know, people coming into the state, does that offset that a little bit or? Yeah, so the best news for Florida is New York. So <laughs> they don't know how to run an economy in New York. <laughs> They're trying to tax everything and driving everything down here. I, you know, I joke that, you know, Brickell Avenue may be the new Wall Street before we're all said and done with the taxes on homes over $5 million, the, the proposed taxes on, you know, securities, trades and whatnot. They just don't get mm -hmm. it. And so when you look at the success of what Florida's done, and I think it's well over a hundred different types of tax cuts, you look at the growth in the economy, you know, why people want to come here. Mm -hmm. You're just hitting on all cylinders. You're doing all the right things. And uh, so you're a big beneficiary of that in migration. And these are high paying jobs that can afford to buy homes and second homes and whatnot. So yeah. uh, that that's good news. Let the Northeast continue to screw up and Florida will be the beneficiary. <laughs> Uh, another topic you brought up is something that was kind of new and not a lot of people in the room knew the term yet, but it was lease accounting. Can yeah. you explain that and how that can affect commercial uh, land values? Yeah, so it's one of the um, most untold stories that affects us at the end of this year. So at the end of 2019, uh, all public companies will have to report the liability of their leases on their, on their balance sheet. Mm -hmm. So essentially the U.S. accounting system is coming up to par or on the same par with European and global accounting where leases are part of the liability on a balance sheet. Until this point in time, ours has just been footnotes. Mm -hmm. So you think of a Walmart or a Publix or a big retailer with lots and lots of legacy stores that are leased, all of that liability comes on their balance sheet and it comes at the end of the year. Well, everybody knows how to calculate the liability, mm -hmm. but the asset the offsetting asset isn't so well understood. So the accountancy folks haven't clearly defined that for everybody. Uh, all they will tell us it'll have nothing to do with market rent. So that seems crazy because it should be a simple leasehold type of analysis. What do I have? You know, if I, if I negotiated a lease 10 years ago on say a Walmart, I probably have a positive spread there. Mm -hmm. So it should be a bigger asset to offset maybe a newer store. That's probably not gonna happen. So what this means is we could see major companies have credit downgrades because they go from an, say an A2 to a, you know, an A1 or a triple B plus. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is it's more impactful is that we're gonna see many of these retail companies switch and no longer do long-term leases. Mm -hmm. Not doing 10, 15, 20 year leases because they don't want that liability on their balance sheet. So they're gonna be more, more inclined to do a three or five year shorter term lease. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that could have some disruptive impacts on the finance of commercial real estate because the permanent market, life companies and securitization, they want that long term lease to match with the bond and the liability and a short term lease doesn't do them any good. So mm -hmm. it could be interesting how this all plays out. Just a few more questions. Sure. Yes. <laughs> um, you also talked about the NACREF land index. Yeah. You said, uh, you know, landowners should definitely know what this is. So would you explain what that is and how that's something that you use as a resource? Yeah, so NACREF is for a long time tracked the, you know, commercial real estate independent fiduciaries, commercial real estate, shopping centers, office buildings, and looked at the returns on those 
primarily for permanent lenders like life companies. Well, a number of years back, they started tracking that on resident or on land, agricultural, farm, ranch, uh, crop lands. Mm -hmm. And so they've been doing it quite some time. And we saw going into the housing crisis how the returns just plummeted because <laughs> nobody was buying the land as much to chew up for subdivisions. But it's an important index to look because it tracks a lot of the foreign capital that's coming into our land uh, investments in the United States. There's a huge appetite from South Korea, um, from uh, Vietnam and other mm -hmm. countries, Latin American countries, that really value the land, the tangible asset. And despite everything that's been going on with tariffs and the trade war and commodity prices, the overall increase in the NACREF index for the you know billions of dollars that are invested in was almost 7% last year. Mm -hmm. So it's an important index to look at you know the ebb and flow. Do they favor more cropland, more ranch land, more farmland, irrigated? Uh, all those issues, but it's a good bellwether. So if you've got substantial land holdings, it's an index you may want to pay attention to. And it'll cheer you up. <laughs> it's all good news right now. You also mentioned the USDA Florida uh, report and how they talk about Florida land, how that affects Florida land values, that um, uh, some of our land values or returns are much higher than at the national level for agriculture. Can you talk about Florida as agriculture industry and agricultural land? and? And what is most important for people to know who uh, have those holdings? Yeah, and we'll even say we won't talk about cannabis. <laughs> <laughs> so Florida, um, the USDA does an annual report where they look at, they call it a, a land values and cash rents survey. Mm -hmm. And they pick up every uh, major agricultural uh, transaction over 100 acres. And they look at what was being produced. And they, when it sells, they calculate a cap rate on that transaction. The average cap rate is about 2.5%. So it's, uh, when you look at value, it's, it's much better than mm -hmm. say even a, um, a, a, a highly desired e-commerce warehouse. <laughs> and so Florida, um, its land values, its average per acre is 50% greater than the national average. Mm -hmm. um, so national average is around $6,100 and Florida's is up about 8,000 uh, an acre. So, uh, and it's only surpassed by California, Arizona, Iowa, the big ag states and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So Florida's uh, agricultural, uh, land values are, are very solid and among the best in the country and well recognized. And the USDA is a great source to track that. Yeah. Well, we did have Holly Bell here yesterday and uh, she did talk about industrial hemp and, and cannabis um, as well. So I know that a lot of our viewers, especially in the citrus industry, are you know, going to be watching to see what happens and what, what this is going to do and what opportunities uh, we have coming. And, I don't know if you have any information on that. I know a lot of that, the legislation isn't done, and so it's all kind of a big unknown yeah. here right now, but do you think that that's going to be a positive uh, thing for Florida? It will. Um, so on any of these things, they're disruptive, so you have to figure out what are the um, unintended consequences. Does it push you know, one thing out versus another? Uh, one thing I talked about was the growth of um, vertical farming. So mm -hmm. we don't need to do as much horizontal and chew up land or dis it doesn't need to be as disruptive. We can use an empty mall or a warehouse or something to, to grow yeah. uh, the hemp and the cannabis in a more controlled environment. And uh, you use 1% of the water and 1 one hundredth of the fertilizers. So from a water and environmental standpoint, I think what we could find is that um, whatever Florida decides on the cannabis and the hemp, that a lot of it is probably gonna go more of a vertical indoor farming model mm -hmm. than a horizontal. And uh, that's good for the environment, it's good for water, and it's good for um, controlling it. And then I did want to ask you about um, the affordable housing gap and that effect that it has on <laughs> land values in our area especially. Yeah, so it's all relative. So, you know, you guys feel home prices are up a lot, especially South Florida, what you've seen here in Orlando or Tampa, mm -hmm. even, even Lakeland, I mean, what, what you've seen, the growth. It's all relative compared to other parts of the country, but it is a real problem. At this point in the cycle, normally we would see us building about a million three to a million five homes a year. We're only building around a million one or two. Mm -hmm. And the reason is after the housing crisis, uh, and you look at what's happened with construction costs, um, builders can't make a decent margin building under $300,000 homes. Mm -hmm. So as the um, millennials get to a point where they've got jobs and careers and they can move out and form their own households, they can't find the product. They don't right. have the income or the credit scores. So it's a real problem. So I think it means we're gonna see more of a mix towards multifamily. And we're gonna see innovation in product like tiny home subdivisions. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing them in Atlanta, we have two tiny home subdivisions. They're the modern day version of a mobile home uh, manufactured community. Um, but it's kind of the new, the new twist by the millennials. But I think we're going to see more urban 
receive more rental than for sale. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the builders have just said, we're just gonna build where we make a good margin. So it's not that things are terrible in housing. The builders, if you look at their public reports, their margins and their profits are very good. They've just figured out how to build fewer making more rather than a lot making a little. And um, my last question for you was, what drives land values overall in Florida? You mentioned freight ways and how important that is. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, so I just published a paper on logistics and logistics infrastructure. And so one of the key things, whether it's farmland, cropland, or land for development, you know, warehouses or the city growing out, it's really your proximity to logistics infrastructure. And that's not roads and tollways and bridges. It's the ports, it's intermodal, it's rail, it's all of those connectivity, what I call freightways. Uh -huh. And so this paper called Logistics Infrastructure, the Transformational Opportunities uh, that we just published about, it's a nice little short 50 page paper, but I promise you lots of pictures. So we had a nice <laughs> little logistics transformer in there. Um, but people need to, to think when they look at their land and think about their proximity to logistics infrastructure. So Lakeland, for example, mm -hmm. it's, the Inland, it's the Inland Empire of Florida. You've got the intermodal, you've got the rail, you've got basically a center collection point for everything from Tampa and Jacksonville and up from Miami. So that land now has tremendous value from everybody that's doing any kind of supplying distribution uh, you know, really into Florida. It's the central point that they're gonna emanate out from. So yeah. if you don't know where your intermodal facilities are, if you don't know where your rail connections are, if you don't know where all that logistics infrastructure is, you're probably leaving a lot of the value on the table. Mm -hmm. don't, don't overlook your logistics infrastructure. And you did also say that you felt, I think you said, that Florida would outgrow California as an agriculture yeah. center. Absolutely. So I joke, you know, I get uh, I get invited to speak in Texas a lot. I don't get yeah. invited to speak out in California very much because I'm not very bullish on the economy. So I joke that, um, you know, in Texas, they're going to continue to frack oil, even if energy prices drop to $10 a barrel, because they're trying to do their patriotic duty to keep pressure on the San Andreas. So California just goes in the ocean and all problems are solved. right? So, um, you know, one of the things that's happening is California has a lot of problems. They have water issues, they have uh, cost issues, uh, budget. And it really is getting cost prohibitive to, to grow agriculture in California, whether it's the water, whether it's the logistics, the faraway transportation. Florida is becoming a very viable alternative to that. And so they're really becoming a collector of all kinds of fresh vegetables and produce from all times of the year, whether it's you know blueberries from you know somewhere in Latin America at the, during the winter months when we want them, or strawberries or lettuce or whatnot. Tampa has become a major collection point mm -hmm. of that. And so they can easily distribute up, they can collect more, uh, they don't have the water issues because now we can uh, you know, not only grow it here in Florida, but you can also supplement it with all over Latin America that you, in South America that you can bring in here. So my forecast is that I think within the next decade we will see Florida replace California mm -hmm. as our primary um, uh, source for our fresh fruit and vegetables all year long. They're closer to where 70% of the population lives. They're closer to all the logistics infrastructure, all the rail that moves all the way to New York and Chicago and all the dense population centers. It's affordable and you can source it from, from all over. The other benefit that people forget is by Florida being able to source this produce and vegetables mm -hmm. from Latin and South America, they're actually helping with the immigration problem because now we're leaving that labor in place. Mm -hmm. We don't have it you know, migrate into California and have all those problems and issues to harvest it. You're now leaving it in place. You're actually creating some economic benefit for those economies. So it also has a very beneficial economic thing. So yeah. go Florida, solve the wall, solve immigration, solve <laughs> food, all of those things. You're solving all the problems. And any parting knowledge or wisdom you'd want to share with our Florida landowners? Yeah, so I think you know the other one we touched base a little bit on is you know kind of the overall macro outlook. I'm very positive. I think we're, we're one trade deal away mm -hmm. from being back at a 3% economy. And I emphasize the importance of, of the United States, of us ratifying this new USMCA NAFTA II mm -hmm. deal, because it really puts a new type of trade structure between Canada, all of North America, Canada, US, and Mexico. And it's less about where you manufacture or assemble the mm -hmm. good or product, and it's that it's done in a high wage zone. So Mexico is gonna have to become a high wage zone, which br brings up their middle class and all that type of stuff. That agreement passing is critical to basically us seeing trade deals come to fruition with both uh, Europe and China. They are terrified of us being united and united mm -hmm. having a trade deal in North America. And I think if we get that passed, we see trade deals come very, very quickly with Europe and China. So don't demagogue it. It's a good thing. It's very good for Florida. Well, thank you so much.
Mr. Conway. Well, thank you. And uh, we appreciate you being here. And we'll have some of your resources and yep. papers and things posted. And uh, yeah, and if they miss anything, they can yeah. always go. The stuff I publish with the CCIM Institute is at CCIM.com. It's called the Insight Series. So we did papers on uh, Amazon's headquarters search, adaptive reuse, uh, the Fed, real estate finance distribution. We have a new one publishing today called Long May You Run, uh, okay. Neil L Young classic rock song. And then anything that I produce with the university is uh, at ACRE, Alabama Center for Real Estate. So we like that nice ACRE unit of land measure acronym. So it's uh, ACRE.culverhouse.ua.edu uh, and okay. all my stuff is there. All right, well, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Yeah.